Good evening and welcome to the forensic analysis of the Lincoln Oak skeletal remains. We appreciate your coming to watch our presentation. My name is Kimberly Carew. I'm an educator with the New Haven Museum. We're gonna wait just a minute or two while people begin to join us. And we would ask that if you have any questions that you put them in our chat. And if you're watching on Facebook Live, put your questions in the comments because we will be gathering them as well and presenting them to uh, our, our presenters to answer. So we'll just wait another minute or two. And I would just like to thank the UI uh, for sponsoring and supporting us through their Lighting Up the Arts program. We appreciate that. Nick Bellantoni serves as the Emeritus State Archaeologist with the Connecticut State Museum of Natural History at UConn. He also serves as an adjunct associate research professor in the Department of Anthropology at UConn and was a former president of the Archaeological Society of Connecticut and the National Association of State Archaeologists. Gary Aronson is a biological anthropologist and director of the Yale University Biological Anthropology Laboratories. He began his career in archaeology and his research branches between primate ecology, behavior, and bioarchaeological investigations of skeletal elements locally and globally. He studied at the City University of New York Hunter College Georgetown, George Washington University, and Yale University. I'd like to introduce both Nick Bellantoni and Gary Aronson. Thanks, Kim. Thank you for having us on board. Hi there. How's everybody doing today? All right. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. I appreciate everybody's patience as we get through this. Many of you are familiar with the complexities of Zoom work. And so I'm hoping that everybody can see our slides now. So Nick and I have given many presentations together uh, through the years. And so a little virtual tag teams in order versus our usual thing. So every once in a while, if you see us waving our hands and things like that, that means somebody's got to do a shot. But uh, <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and let uh, uh, Nick lead us off. But uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. And I want to be very clear that the work that we're presenting here is certainly not the work of us alone but uh, a large team of other professionals, colleagues, researchers, local historians, um, and very importantly, students who uh, are also helping to learn more about this remarkable story of our local and our global history. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it right over to, um, to Nick. Okay, thank you, Gary. And just uh, so you all understand that there are gonna be images of human skeletal remains shown in this presentation. So we just want you uh, to be aware of that. They're very fragmentary, but that they will be there. Okay, so this all starts, as many of you know, with Superstorm Sandy that came into the state, actually starting tomorrow, I guess, on uh, October 29th, 2012. And it was a devastating storm, but many of you have felt the effects of it in terms of the lost power, property damage. Over uh, 200 people were killed and within eight countries going up from the Caribbean into Canada. Uh, and so there was just heavy, heavy damage uh, in the hundreds of millions of dollars. And of course, it damaged the New Haven Green. And with that, probably the biggest thing was the felling of the Lincoln Oak tree. So the Lincoln Oak was actually long, it'd been there for uh, over a hundred years on the green. It was planted in 1909 with the, on the hundredth anniversary of Abraham Lincoln's birth. Uh, and when the storm came through, it was like a nor'easter. It came in really with the winds coming east to west. And when it did, it toppled the tree, not just cracking it, but literally bringing the root systems all up. Um, that was on the 29th. The next day, as people started to recover from the storm, um, it, could you go back, Gary, to that one? Yeah, it, people started to recover from the storm. Um, people walking by on the green noticed that there appeared to be skeletal remains caught in the, in the root mat. Um, and as a result, the New Haven Police Department came on board. Uh, the Office of the State Chief's Medical Examiner came on board and came down. They contacted not only Gary, uh, 
but also uh, Alfredo Camargo came down and did the original analysis. When they saw what they had found in terms of that tree root, uh, the first thing they had to do was determine that this was not in fact um, a modern criminal investigation, that this was not a, 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 a modern homicide or missing persons. When it was well established by Gary and the others that the remains were in fact old because of cortical loss and decomposition, that's when the, uh, the, um, um, the investigation was turned over to the state archeologist. And I came down on the 31st of October to conduct the uh, excavations and Gary and I uh, worked on them together along with students from Yale University, as well as volunteers from the Friends of the Office of State Archaeology. But it was at that point that we started to do controlled excavations of the root map. And of course, October 31st is Halloween. So we got quite a, a, a welcoming when we, we were there and doing the work by the press and, and, and many others. But um, this was a difficult excavation because as you could see on the top photograph, how the tree fell, um, and you could see with the root mat, we actually had to work in, how do you want to say, a vertical excavation as opposed to normally when we, when we do our excavations, they're primarily horizontally down into the ground. So um, this was kind of a, a, a very difficult and delicate uh, excavation, I might add, because the fact was that the, the human remains were caught up into the root mat and they were very fragile. And of course, the root mat was breaking up some of the, the uh, elements. So we, we, we had to work uh, very carefully uh, and, and controlled. What we tried to do is work on a system so that we divided the, um, the root mat up into sections and excavated through that. And really what ended up happening is working, you see here in these photographs with some of the students uh, at Yale and uh, it, it was a very delicate and tedious piece of business. It took us a, a few days to get everything completely out. Um, one of the things I could tell you is I was quite surprised that um, the root mat uh, actually encompassed the, the skeletal remains. And that's because you think of burials uh, going down, you know, four, five, six feet below ground. The root mat, you know, exposed goes outward as opposed to deep. So it brought skeletal remains up that were relatively shallow in the soil. Uh, and that kind of surprised me. I, th I think my answer to that primarily is that there had probably been a lot of landscaping going on on the New Haven Green, especially in the, probably in the late 19th, early 20th century, so that um, the remains were shallower now than they might well have been when they were first interred, so that the root systems could get uh, entwined with it. Another thing that we found other than human remains is we actually found coffin remains and coffin hardware primarily. Um, and in that we found basically nails, uh, hard, hardware nails that were, were used uh, the, to hold the boards together. These were wooden coffins, most likely hexagonal in shape. Uh, and that we also found evidence of brass tacks. And basically from a period from about the late 18th into the early 19th century, probably 1770s to 1830s, uh, one of the techniques in, in burial on coffins was to hammer, take brass tacks and hammer the initials of the people laying there. So in my case, it would be NB and then the, the age of death usually underneath. Uh, sometimes they were surrounded in a heart motif uh, and could, certainly a Christian sign of endearment. Unfortunately, because of the destruction of the root mat and the decomposition, we basically were not able to reconstruct the tax uh, into seeing what the patterns of the, the, the numbers or the, uh, the letters might have been. But the fact that they had those tax is pretty helpful in terms of dating, uh, again, a late 18th, uh, early 19th century uh, burials here. So the Lincoln Oak, let's go into that uh, to give you some context here. Uh, the Lincoln Oak, as I mentioned, was planted on, uh, in 1909. <clears throat> now, as you all know, because we celebrate it still, Lincoln's birthday is in February. 
however, in February in New Haven, it's kind of gotten frozen ground and, you know, uh, quite a snow depth. So we couldn't plant an oak tree. So they waited until April 9th. And that turns out to be, of course, the anniversary, the 44th anniversary of um, the end of the Civil War with the surrender at Appomattox. So in April 9th, 1909, they had a commemoration. They planted the oak tree and it was planted by the Admiral of Foot post of the Grand Army of the Republic. Now the Grand Army of the Republic was a fraternal organization that was in the late 19th, early 20th century. It was basically composed of veterans from the Union Army, Navy, and Marines. Uh, and um, it was founded just shortly after the Civil War uh, uh, in Springfield, Illinois. Um, and there were hundreds of posts all over the United States. The, the Grand, uh, and of course, New Haven, the Admiral Foot Post in New Haven was one of the prominent ones. It eventually, um, um, you know, the, the Grand Army of the Republic eventually died out when Civil War soldiers started to die out. So by, by 1930, uh, it was uh, pretty much the fraternal order was pretty much gone. But at the base of the planting, they put a memorial stone in for the oak tree. And, and that turned out to be pretty important because while we were working out there and you could see here a slide of them removing the root system once Gary and I finished the excavation process, uh, one of your local New Haven historians uh, that you may know, Rob Greenberg, uh, had done while we were working, so was doing some archival research and he found some newspapers at that time. And when he found the newspapers at that time, they mentioned the articles in 1909 of a time capsule being buried. So we had done a complete excavation here and there were no evidences of, of a time capsule or anything like that. However, what we surmise that if there was a time capsule, it may have been at the base of the monument stone. So if you look at the, the slide, the photograph on the, in the lower left-hand corner, you'll see the, the, the monument stone uh, more to the left, you can see the cut stone. But beyond that, you see that whitish material, well, that's cement. And what they had done is they plunged this stone into a cement barrel to give it support in the ground below the frost line so it would maintain itself. Uh, and you could see the outpouring of some of the, in the middle section of, of some of that uh, um, cement. So we hypothesized at that point that if there was a tombstone, it might be in the cement uh, uh, barrel. So that's when we called in our colleagues from Quinnipiac University, uh, uh, the Department of Diagnostic Imaging, Jerry Kunlong and Ron Beckett, who came out. You can see the slide on the left. We used many techniques. The New Haven um, Bomb Squad actually came out and did some x-rays for us, along with the imaging that Quinnipiac University did. And when we uncovered these, and you could see them in situ uh, on the left in the cement, everybody said, open it up. We want, everybody wanted to see what was inside, but I said, no, no, we're going back to the university. We're going to go to the laboratory. Um, I want to know what's in it before we even decide to open it. And that's when at, at Quinnipiac, we did, they did, uh, their teams there did the x-rays and so forth. And you see here, some of the x-ray showing the contents of, uh, these were copper canisters about a foot or so in length. Uh, about four inches or so in diameter. The x-rays clearly show that the artifacts were accumulated at one end of uh, the canisters, which was very helpful to us because then what we did is open the other end so we wouldn't damage anything. But we also saw, so let me, let me just describe some of these things. In the lower right picture, you see that round circle. What that is, is an iron grape shot and that little small configuration next to it is actually a mini ball. It's a bullet. And both of these artifacts were recovered off the Battle of Gettysburg in Pennsylvania uh, and included as a commemoration here. The one thing that did stump us was that kind of squiggly, you see that filmy wavy texture going through the x-rays? Yeah, and you can see it certainly in, in the circular, the cross section. 
I didn't know, we didn't know at the time whether that was a cloth that was surrounding to keep everything in place, or maybe that it was paper. And of course, when we finally opened uh, the canisters at the University of, of uh, Quinnipiac University, we saw that they were in fact paper. And what they were, for the most part, were nine different newspapers weeklies and dailies from the city of New Haven commemorating um, the event. Now, today you all get your news, news from internet, TV, radio, wherever you choose to get it. But back then in 1909, the primary source was newspapers. And the city of New Haven had nine newspapers uh, instead of maybe the one we have today. Also in involved were the... Uh, the 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 minutes uh, and a program for the planting for the uh, the foot uh, uh, post and medallions. Um, we also had uh, commemorative coins with Abraham Lincoln on it. That coin on the right is about two inches uh, in diameter. Uh, the one with the ribbon is about one inch. And of course, you could see a Grand Army of the Republic medal on um, on the left hand side. So these were extraordinary uh, artifacts uh, that uh, were ex extremely important, kind of a history uh, of, of the city of New Haven back at that time. And all of the artifacts, by the way, are now curated at the New Haven Museum. Uh, shortly thereafter, they, they did do an exhibit and may have exhibits coming up, but the, the the, these artifacts are now with uh, the New Haven Museum. So I'm going to give it back to Gary to talk about the, the New Haven Green itself. All right. So thank you very much, Nick. I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks for filling us back in on the, uh, the extraordinary find, the unexpected find of this time capsule. So coming back to the issue at hand of, of finding people in a tree in the middle of a, of a, of a very, very large city. Um, it's important to remember the original history of our town and of our city in that in 1638, when people were coming from Europe and from the United Kingdom to make their settlements, um, you can go to pretty much any town in Connecticut and recognize that these village greens are basically the hub of politics, social, theological, all aspects of existence. And these village and town greens are kind of where everything was happening and so in the 1640s for new haven the green really did represent all of the important components of of the social life the meeting places for political discussions for theological um, and church meetings schools courthouses everything were kind of in this central location many of you are aware of the fact that yale university was established immediately close by to this square but another thing to remember, and something else you can find in many of these New England towns and, and areas, is that the burial plots, the location for the people who live there, they most often were also buried in these town greens. Now, in 1638, we're talking about, again, a relatively small population of individuals that are immigrants to this country, as well as the Native and Indigenous people that were living here at this time. And as early as 1659, there is notes and information in the historical documents about the fact that, again, this green is the hub of all aspects of society in New Haven. And it's already becoming clear that the cemetery is beginning to fill up a bit quicker than the city or the town or the village is able to handle. So in 1659, Governor Newman had brought up that perhaps we should be considering what to do with the uh, New Haven Green Cemetery. And regrettably, in 1660, um, the governor passed away, and he was then buried in the very cemetery that he was describing as possibly an issue. In 1683, there are records in New Haven of putting a fence around the cemetery to find some way to segregate it from the rest of the communal activities going on. However, a fence was not put up. And in an interesting thing about how you can look at municipal politics, both currently and back in the day, um, it was repeatedly brought up to do something about setting up this uh, setup. You can see some aspects of what this cemetery looked like by going into the church in the green, and a section of the cemetery still exists that kind of shows what we're look, talking about when we're talking about a cemetery construction. But even these early kind of representational things versus maps illustrate the fact that 
a structured cemetery system, a structured plot system is not necessarily in place at this time. People are passing away from a variety of causes, which I'll talk about at the end of our presentation. But again, it's just kind of a large communal burial plot that many, many people are going into at or around the same time with very little kind of planning about how this is going to be managed. Apparently in 1775, it becomes clear that a fence becomes established. It's also a time period. Remember, I'm talking about six, 700 people early on. Now we're talking about 5,000 people at the end of the 18th century in New Haven. This is also a time period where we're starting to get more and more reports about the fact that due to diseases, due to a variety of factors I'll describe in more detail near the end, um, people are now being buried very quickly and very quietly in what are called midnight burials. This is not an uncommon um, factor in many aspects of New England society or other parts of the United States, but it is a factor that the burials are not either managed or controlled by any kind of authority who's handling cemetery business. Instead, people are passing away, families are burying their family members quickly, um, closing the grave site and then leaving it. But remember, we're talking about many, many, many people, different depths, different locations. And so we really are starting to see a lot of people kind of accumulating in a small place in a relatively rapid amount of time. 1796 is when the decision's made that it's time to make some changes to how it is that New Haven City handles its dead. And our city is one of the most interesting locations in the world where we are one of the first planned public cemeteries. And as Nick had pointed out to me in a conversation earlier, uh, a burial ground or a burial site is very much kind of people get buried in a place because it's available. The cemetery is again, a planned, programmed, structured place to deposit and, and bury the dead. The proprietors met in 1797 and it's at this time, and here's another image that basically shows a painting from that time period that shows the first inklings of kind of a fence. This image is from a painting that's at the New Haven Museum. Outside of town is Grove Cemetery. So for those of you that live or in the New Haven area now, you recognize the fact that it's in town, very much so. But back at this time period, we're talking about the movement of the cemetery and the burial system into a place that's outside of the center of the New Haven proper. And as you can see here, it was a period of time in the early 1800s that Yale students were among those that would assist in cleaning up the New Haven green proper. But cleaning up the green proper simply means that headstones are actually lifted from the New Haven green and deposited in this cemetery. The stone wall and everything isn't here at this early time period, but all of these headstones are moved, but not the people. Those that are wealthy, those that had the resources available to them that could make the move, they have established plots and established locations in Grove Cemetery. But the majority of individuals who were interred in New Haven Green from the 1600s to the very, very beginning of the 1800s, the, most of those people were never moved, but stones were moved. Coming up to where we are today, as the center church is being built, as more and more things are happening in New Haven and the city's becoming more formalized, it's becoming more urban and things like that, it's becoming more and more important to organize and move um, the bodies and move the headstones and things. There is a very important case that happened, the resurrectionist um, situation that occurred through much of America in the mid 1800s, where bodies were being looted from graves for the purposes of teaching medical students anatomy and things like that. This is no longer the case today, um, but it's another example of trying to organize and manage the dead in a more effective and strategic manner within the city and across the United States in general. In 1849, there was the excavation for the Dixwell Monument that you can see today. 16 more bodies were recovered then. In the 1890s, there are, there are bones found during, again, more municipal work. There aren't many notes about 20th century discoveries that I've been able to find, but that kind of brings us to where we are today, that when the tree had fallen, we recognize, okay, well, there's a burial system. There are most likely thousands of bodies still present on the site, but there is no effective map ever created by any, or we haven't found any, 
um, really clear maps, only these kind of representational drawings about what the cemetery looks like. And again, this 1748 map, which is again, the middle of the 18th century, we're talking about late 19th century in some respects, you can see that the borders and the structure are very, very loosely defined. When we do a composite map that was just made by my colleague, Yokiko Tonoike here at Yale University, we basically tried to map the location of the Lincoln Oak and then this 1748 concept of the kind of structure of the cemetery at that time. And again, this kind of reiterates the point that Nick had brought up about the archeological evidence that suggests that we're looking at possibly late period inhumations because the burials are occurring kind of near the more peripheral edges of what this uh, cemetery location purportedly is set up as from a 1748 representational map. So with that, I'd like to talk a little bit about what it is that happens when discoveries like this are made. Nick, uh, the current state archeologist, Sarah Sportman, um, and many colleagues and I have worked, uh, as pointed out by the introduction, on trying to understand if bones are found, what is it that we can tell? I wanna be very, very clear on this point to all the members of the audience. I am not a forensic anthropologist. Um, I'm a biological anthropologist. And so my work is trying to understand and infer aspects of what bones and teeth and bodies can tell us about people. And so in understanding this, what we wanna talk about is that bones and teeth reflect both the evolutionary history of a species or of an individual and the circumstances upon which a person is living in. And so bones represent a physics and engineering question, you know, the biomechanics of being able to stand up and walk around, the biomechanics of chewing, you need hard tissues to hang muscles off of or to be able to chew food. They represent evolutionary biology and adaptation. We are bipedal primates. We come from ancestors that are quadrupedal in origin. Obviously DNA and structures of DNA kind of put things together. We are the result of our evolutionary history, as I just pointed out. Aspects of developmental stability or instability, how our mothers and how our families have been dealt with nutritional stressors, environmental stressors, impact aspects of bone morphology and bone growth. Individual physiology, aspects of being able to intake vitamin D or process vitamin D or other factors come into play. Individual life histories, those of us that have been either fortunate or unfortunate enough to break a bone recognize that once a bone is broken, bones will heal themselves. We all do things. Those of us that are rowers or are doing manual labor or doing physical labor or specific kinds of labor, those kinds of parameters can leave markers on bone, thus indicating activity or agency that a person may have been doing that might be left on bones or teeth. Clearly aspects of health and disease affect many aspects of our bodies. Um, we're living in a pandemic, which is why we're all sitting here on our Zooms right now. There aren't very many health or disease issues that leave bony or dental signatures, but there are some that exist as I'll describe in some detail shortly. One of the things people are most interested or talk about the most are aspects of conflict and injury that can occur in individuals that you can see aspects of trauma, uh, violence and things like that. And on a larger scale, bones can reflect aspects of the social existence, the social milieu within which an individual lived. And aspects of economic disparity and racism and structural issues can also be reflected in skeletal or dental structures. The pattern you see here of the very bright and clear or very evident information and those that are a bit more difficult to establish or interpret using scientific means and evidence are kind of illustrated by this gradation in color. However, many, many researchers, including myself, are really trying to look at how it is that these hard tissues are left behind from our relatives, from our ancestors, and from our friends can provide us information about the kind of life history that they are experiencing both individually and as part of the social community that they were living in. So bone is alive and reflects your individual community and species level characters. They are what remain from us in most cases after death. They can preserve soft tissue and DNA and they can reflect chemical factors. 
And because of that, they can tell us quite a bit about different aspects of individual life history and the society within which people live. So with that explanation of how it is somebody like myself and my colleagues might interpret or examine osteological evidence, as pointed out in the beginning of the talk, a set of human remains was clearly visible in this root ball. Upon further examination and careful excavation by Nick and our colleagues, we were able to identify that there were multiple individuals, again, collated within this root ball. Looking at the evidence of the burial strategies, the pattern and the number of people within the green helps us understand why so many individuals might be in such a small space and in such an interesting and kind of odd scatter among these tree roots. These images reflect the conditions and the number of elements that are present. As you can tell, we are talking about human remains that were recovered from a New England environment. Those of you that are familiar with aspects of anthropology or osteology and things, the more you're in a cold climate or in a arid climate, preservation of cloth, of tissues can be very, very effective. New England is very well known for its highly acidic soils. It's well known for its freeze thaw changes. All of these factors have very, very serious effects on the preservation and quality of bone. Um, it's a bit of a metaphysical point on my end, but I would suggest that in some respects, the root ball and the structure of that tree was actually important in providing a bit more of a buffered environment for the preservation, not just of adult human skeletal remains, but also the remains of several children that were present in the collection as well. The remains include some very, very small aspects of some hair that was still retained. There are other individuals that are only represented by very small fragments of bone. And so in some cases we have enough elements to be able to describe aspects of who these people were. And in other cases, we only have very, very few elements that again, make it very, very difficult for a more concrete understanding of their individual lives. But looking at aspects of what is available does provide us some insights to who these people were and what they were dealing with. I have to reiterate this point that I, in many respects, see myself as a very superficial investigator. Not because of the fact that I'm not doing my job right, but it's that I'm looking at bones and teeth from many aspects of surface level kinds of questions, which have important interpretations and identifications. However, it is through the work of a multidisciplinary team of other researchers who can focus on things like examining genetic markers that might be preserved and looking at isotopic signatures and looking at the x-rays that are present to tell us more about internal structures or internal characteristics, as well as working with our colleagues in archeology span and historical context to really tie together how a single set of teeth or bones can reflect a broader set of both scientific signals as well as historical or archeological narratives. And so it's very much this concept that we work together as a team to understand these, with the ultimate goal being that we prepare these individuals for as much of a description as possible, and then ultimately repatriation and reburial um, with the New Haven authorities to whatever local um, repository is most effective for them to be taken to. It's been a long time and I appreciate that. And we did have a two year break in this laboratory system because of the um, pandemic. The results that I'm able to talk about today, unfortunately, are still somewhat limited. And one of the most difficult limitations we're facing is that efforts to amplify genetic data remain elusive. So we've done multiple attempts to try and get DNA from these remains. But the description I just gave about the taphonomic or the environmental factors that influence um, preservation remain a huge challenge. So we are making one final effort because technology techniques and researchers have become so much more effective just in the past three years. Um, I am making one last attempt to try and see if there's any possibility of amplification of DNA in these individuals. But at the moment I can talk about some of the things we are able to describe based on some of the skeletal elements that are present. An important thing that I can describe to you is that in 
pretty much every single set of remains that have some set of teeth or bones that show more individual characteristics, many of these individuals show markers of some kind of metabolic stress. And metabolic stress is difficult to kind of describe or identify precisely, because as shown here, you could imagine that an environmental stress can be very much a situation of being in a conflict situation where you're constantly bombarded by concerns. So your physiology is going to be affected by this or being in environments where you're constantly having to struggle for food or to build shelters or things like that. So that can be a stressor that can influence aspects of bone development and bone structure impacts of immunological events, like living with a very, very serious set of chronic diseases or having to deal with parasitic infections and things like that. These are stressors that influence your individual metabolic pattern. Or what seems very obvious, nutritional factors, not getting enough micro and macronutrients can definitely leave very significant bony markers um, and dental markers. And what we see in these individuals is that many of the individuals are showing these very small perturbations in the inlay or the development of enamel. Um, we're all on Zoom, so I can't really look at your teeth at the moment, but I expect that if you go to the mirror tonight and look at your dentition or you run your finger down your front teeth, it should be pretty much as smooth as glass. You're gonna have a really nice set of teeth in your mouth. However, some of us, and in the past, many of us in the human species, and as I'll talk about in a minute, in Connecticut, every once in a while, if an event occurred during the development of the permanent dentition in the mouth of a child, if a stressor would occur, your physiology, your adaptation, would be to limit the amount of enamel being deposited because something's gone wrong. There's something happening in your body that requires more immediate metabolic intervention, and so these small perturbations can be indicators that something had happened at that time period that provided some kind of an effect that led that individual not to put as much enamel on as they normally would. These linear enamel hypoplasias can have multiple causes, but their presence in multiple individuals, again, suggests many of these individuals were struggling with some kind of event. We cannot infer that they're all from the same time period. We cannot infer that these burials are all from the same age range or age of death and burial. There's no information on that at all, unfortunately, for the green. So it's hard to say if this is kind of a snapshot of a time period or a snapshot of the colony in general. But we also see markers through radiology, through Knipiak University researchers, of possibilities of arrest lines in some of the bone uh, long bones, we can see that one of the individuals has relatively shorter forelimb elements than expected, another indication of potential nutritional deficits. In other words, in many respects, we see factors on these bones that seem to suggest that there are things happening to them that are causing skeletal and dental disruptions. Another important thing to recognize is that diet and nutrition of an individual represents the kinds of foods that they're taking in from their local communities. In other words, those of you that enjoy going to farmer's markets, the food that you're eating from your local farmer's market is plants and animals that are taking in mineral and isotopic signatures from the soils and rocks that they're growing from. So in other words, those that have been eating foods from a place like Haiti, or from Oklahoma, or from Connecticut, or from South Africa, or from New Delhi. Each of these places have local soil and local rock geologies, and their patterns of isotopes, their patterns of minerals, their patterns of elements show slight variations. We eat plants, we eat animals, and our teeth, our bones will take some of these soil, some of these elemental compositions and incorporate them into our structures. And the result of this is that through analysis of these tissues broken down into an elemental level, you can tell things about how people ate and potentially where people came from in terms of geographic origin. 
the most common way we examine this from a dental perspective or from a dietary perspective is that the long story short, certain plants consume certain kinds of carbon isotopes and certain kinds of plants and other animals consume other types of carbon or release certain kinds of carbon isotopes. And this basic split about eating lots of ground-based animals like pigs and beef and things like that, or eating lots of wheat can have a very specific kind of chemical or isotopic signature than those that eat a lot of corn or have a lot of fish in their diet. And so we're able to examine and extract enamel bone to try and examine these kinds of questions. And our colleagues at the University of Florida Gainesville were able to examine the New Haven Green individuals and compare them to a group of individuals that Nick and I published on a couple of years ago now from the 1850s here in New Haven. Uh, a community that were in a Catholic church that was identified in the 1850s, um, where we recovered human remains and described and published them just a short time ago. The dental and isotopic signature of these 1850s individuals are represented here. Again, this is from dental enamel. This is the signature of these 1790s, late 18th century individuals from the green. Their lack of overlap is an indication that even in the same city, separated by 150 years or so, the patterns of diet are very different between these two communities, these sets of remains. Obviously, there's many other questions that are unanswered. However, this is how people like myself will take biological information or biological signatures and then do our best to try and interpret through working with archaeologists and working with historians what can these data tell us about the patterns of diet and the patterns of food consumption that we know are occurring in these areas at this time period? So with that, there are many other aspects that are still ongoing um, in relation to describing and identifying other factors going on that can be identified in these remains. But the results that we have now have been able to give us a little bit more insight into some aspects of what life was like in colonial New Haven and in colonial Connecticut. And I'm going to turn it over to Nick so we could talk a little bit about kind of what's happening in the state and in the city um, at this time that we think that these burials are most likely associated with. Well, when we look at the, the end part, actually, when we start becoming a republic ourselves, when we start after we've won our independence and you, you get into uh, the turn of the, of the 19th century, um, one of the stresses you see in the local communities is a decrease in population. People are moving out and especially young people. Uh, you know, we think of that today, that we're losing a lot of young people going to other places in the country or overseas to work. And Connecticut, you know, is trying to hope, keep people home um, for our economic uh, well-being. But this was going on in the early 19th century. And what was happening is that uh, people were basically moving westward and they were going out to Pennsylvania and Northeast Ohio, where that area was opening up. And basically they did that because of the King's Charter. In 1662, Charles II wrote a charter for the Connecticut colony. And what he did is stipulated boundaries. And one of the boundaries, so it was a, you know, the 70 or so mile latitude, north and south, but going west, the boundary becomes the Pacific Ocean. That is to say, Connecticut colony based on the charter of the king gave us a strip of land going completely across the country to the Pacific Ocean. Well, many Connecticuts took advantage of this and uh, many of them started to move out. We almost went to war with Phil, uh, Pennsylvania over this because they were they were declaring their state at this point or, or, or colony. Um, and we started moving west. Um, when you look at Northeast Ohio, uh, there, it looks like there are many areas that look like Connecticut in terms of the way, like Gary described, centers and the villages and towns growing around it. Give you a great example of this is a, a story of a, a guy by the name of Moses Cleveland. 
Moses Cleveland was born in Canterbury, Connecticut, in the eastern part of the state. He went out to Ohio to help survey the area for Connecticuts to come and migrate out there and establish their farms in that less stony, flatter soil. Well, he helped start a little village on, the, uh, the, on Lake Erie uh, that eventually would be named after him. And he, um, we have a letter from him uh, writing back to his family in Connecticut. And he says in a letter, my fondest hope is that someday Cleveland will become as big as Canterbury. Well, little did he know he'd have the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Huh? <laughs> but the point is, People were leaving. And when you look at town records and when you look at census records at this time, um, many towns are stressed that they do not have the, the farms are breaking up. And so what this might have a play, what Gary's finding in some of those biological data, uh, the fact that, um, you know, uh, agricultural production is starting to become limited until it rebounds. Um, and there are a lot of economic uncertainties because we're losing people. So, um, and as a result of that, there's a high rate of food import coming in now uh, that may have not been, uh, been there before. So socioeconomic dis dis uh, disparities. Uh, but what's interesting here is that we could read about that history. We could document that history in the early 19th century. But it's really amazing when we have the skeletal remains to help us understand it, especially on the personal level. So I'm going to give it back to Gary uh, and let him interpret the biological data in light of this. Yeah. And so it's been interesting for me. Again, I, I'm doing my best to become uh, as effective a historian I can be to try and learn more about what I'm seeing from a biological pattern. But it is interesting to consider the fact, and my daughter being a huge Hamilton fan is also helping me learn a little bit how this stuff works. The, <laughs> the period after the Revolutionary War and the nature of Connecticut ecology and the nature of Connecticut soil and production are factors coming into play about how our state's doing both economically, socially, and um, agriculturally at this time period. Another interesting thing that comes up when we consider the fact of where we're seeing these enamel hypoplasias is the question of, remember, these are permanent teeth that are in the mouths of children, developing children. And so what we're seeing is that many of these individuals, remember, when I'm talking about the placement of enamel, the development of enamel, what we're doing is we're starting at the occlusal edge or the place where the biting occurs and just slowly laying new layers of enamel but it's very, very consistent in timing. It's very structured. And this is occurring inside of the maxilla and mandible while the baby teeth are present. But these permanent teeth are what are forming inside of the baby's mouths. And we consider this when we're talking about the fact, well, it's occurring at a very specific time period in general for many of these individuals. One of our working hypotheses was that, well, maybe this is the result of a very classic thing that can occur for children, which is the transition from mother's milk to food can be a stressful period for children. There are an increased risk of pathogens because kids are now getting food from the external environment versus getting it from mom. Uh, nutritional stresses, not, the, not having high availability of food can all be factors on why you can start seeing these metabolic effects, which can lead to enamel changes. However, again, looking at this through the historical lens to say, well, what do we know about the patterns of weaning for colonial women in New England? We're finding that the patterns of weaning occur at a very specific age. And there's even data from some very effective um, midwives and from physicians that are describing the pattern and process of weaning for colonial women in this area where weaning's occurring at a time when it makes kind of sense when you're thinking about environmental changes, nutritional stressors that can occur within families. Aspects of how the kid was doing can definitely be a factor on deciding whether to wean or not to wean. But weaning in general is a very much a specific endpoint, um, which is highly variable in cultures all over the planet. Weaning patterns are really, really interesting to study from an anthropological perspective. However, given the data we're seeing here from available historical documentation of weaning practices for 
colonial New England women, what we're seeing in our individuals is not consistent with what's happening as a weaning factor. So we're able to use hypothesis testing, investigative analyses to try and determine whether or not a potential answer or potential question um, is verified using strictly biological or systematically collected data. The other issue that we know is being faced broadly in the colonies, as well as all parts of the world during this time period, are issues of infectious disease. And it's very commonly known that, or it should be commonly known that the 1790s are a very serious period, especially for this very, very major epi epidemiological event of yellow fever, very well documented and pretty much the start of American medical knowledge practice and sanitary and hygiene practices. So I really encourage you to read more about the yellow fever situation in the 1790s. Upon initial discovery of these individuals, a question came up very much about like, well, are the people we're seeing, are the children we're seeing here representative of these kind of epidemiological events of mortality occurring at this time period? Well, the available data that indicates what was happening with yellow fever as an example is that yellow fever is very much a disease that influences and affects adult mortality. I regret to say something we see very similarly in our current circumstances of the COVID-19 pandemic being faced today. However, there are many, many references in the available literature for the colony, for the state, and for all of the 13 colonies about the presence of other infectious diseases quickly burning through, especially towns and villages of relatively high density. We have a lot of people living in one place at the same time where diseases are very quickly and very easily transmitted amongst and between individuals and family members. And so available data are indicating that the rates of mortality and the risks of illness for young children is always very high, especially in this particular time period. And also there's documented waves of infectious disease occurring in New Haven itself at these very specific periods, which again are indications of the number of different stressors that the New Haven colonial population and the New Haven community were facing at this time period. So while yellow fever is a significant event and a well-known event for Connecticut and for the 13 colonies, these other persistent and very, very virulent um, infectious diseases very much affect children and children's health. Another factor that comes into play when coming into this isotopic analysis that we did is remember New Haven is in a very seasonal environment. Nick brought it up right in the beginning. In February, you're not gonna be planting a tree in the New Haven green. And so we're facing an environment, a community where the entire world shuts down four periods at a time. So you have to make sure that food, nutrition and available um, resources are there. It's this really interesting problem that Nick and I have been kind of tossing back and forth is that we're facing this population drain. There's a lot of people moving, especially from these agricultural centers for better lives, but the cities are still growing. Things are still, there are people moving in, most likely for economic or other opportunities. Connecticut has foods, but there's a lot of factors that come into play. One of the most interesting recent things that I've been trying to read more about is that corn was being regularly consumed as a staple in this period of New Haven, in this period of Connecticut, but New Haven was not growing corn because it wasn't a great crop for us. Instead, available information from a couple of different references described that Virginia was providing an enormous amount of corn to the New Haven colony. When I brought up that information about those stable isotopes, this is a key factor that I wanna focus on more in our research and in our subsequent analyses to really look at this from very much when we talk about where the food came from and the signatures it has, are there any markers that we can see that might be, for lack of a better term, a Virginia marker indicating this food being their primary source versus other potential markers in the 
isotopic signatures that are present. These are analyses that are still ongoing. Like I said, we had an interruption in a lot of our work because of the pandemic, but this is a great nexus between some of the biological information that we're bringing in here and some of the available historical narratives that are present. Other information that's coming in is showing us that there are factors of climate, of ruined crops, of events that are, again, causing instability for these community members. And every time there's instability in a community, in a crowded population, at high risk for infectious disease, at potential risk of nutritional deficits and things like that, again, fundamental psychosocial psychosocial stresses, as many of us have experienced through this pandemic, all of these can lead to osteological or dental markers that associate with these stressors. Our ability to tease the stressors apart are very complex. But again, what we're trying to do here is to try and find a way to combine and complement the available historical narrative for this amazing state and this amazing city to examine these human remains as individuals who live in these societies and these communities and also be able to see how it is that there can be not so much gaps in the narrative but the complexities and the nuances of what's occurring in their individual and daily lives as reflected in some aspects of their biology or in their bodies can reflect more nuanced or more subtle aspects of New Haven's and Connecticut's history at this time period better than um, historical narratives or textbooks can alone. And in my opinion, um, and I would say it as a fact as well, the work by archaeologists like Nick Bellantoni and Sarah Sportsman the collaborative efforts we've had with local and national historians. And again, these efforts by people who are using biological signatures, physiological signatures, weave a far more interesting and a far more nuanced story than any one of us would be able to do as an individual researcher in any respect. Our work is going on, Nick and I are working on many different cases in many parts of the state to try and again understand all of these different nexus points of history, biology, archaeology, um, to try and understand more about what's happening in our state in general. But I want to reiterate this point that we are very much part of a communal effort with the New Haven Museum, with Knipiak University, University of Florida, so many, many different people that we're working with together. Um, and it's a real um, it's a real special moment to be able to work with someone like Nick, um, who's had an amazing career here in Connecticut. And um, it's our hope that we will be able to continue describing and discussing all of these different aspects of New Haven's history through these multiple complex lenses than any one single lens itself. And so with that. I thank you. We both thank you very much for your attention on this. And, uh, and we certainly welcome any questions if you have. Thank you so much, Nick and Gary, for such an interesting presentation, especially given the time with the anniversary of Hurricane Sandy being tomorrow. Um, it was just really very interesting. And we appreciate the update you've given us on your work on the green. Uh, we do have some questions. Kathy asked a while ago, how did you distinguish there were different persons from the small amount of bones in the area? Go ahead, Nick. Well, I'll just say that there's, there's a, it's a two, two-fold pattern. Number one is the, the archaeological recovery, the controls of where all of the remains were coming from, and then sorting through that. The problem was some of them, as you saw from that diagram, that Gary had uh, shows that there was a lot of commingling. So there's the archeological aspect of recovery uh, and being able to separate individuals, but, and I'll turn it back to Gary, it's also being able to, to differentiate individuals based on their skeletal anatomy. 
Yeah. And so in many respects, what we do is that individual skeletal elements and things like that uh, can provide aspects of age um, as well as biological sex uh, based on a very specific set of criteria. So in this particular instance, there was enough distance in the remains from their temporospatial locations to allow for segregation of individuals. But in other cases we've worked on, we've had more intimately connected sets of remains that take a little bit more effort to try and segregate, but that is part of the job of both the osteologist on one end and the archeologist on the other to try and figure that out. Judith asked, how did you identify that several individuals were in the root ball? Just by the process we just talked about that uh, we were able to, the thing was surprising uh, was that there were so many remains and uh, so many children too. I guess that wasn't so surprising, but the root ball was, you know, I came a couple of meters, uh, uh, maybe three meters at the most in length. Uh, so um, it's a limited area. And to see that many burials, of course, or that many individuals in that was quite surprising but a lot of children and the children, you know, in the colonial era, a colonial woman could expect to lose a third of all of her children before they reached adulthood. That was simply a fact of life for many of the reasons that Gary uh, talked about and uh, during his presentation. The, the fact is death was common uh, and burials were not all marked. Not everybody got a tombstone that they were able to place at Grove, Grove uh, Street Cemetery. So um, in some cases, new burials impacted other burials that were already there. So, um, you know, it's sorting through the, the spatial uh, recovery and Gary's work. Along those same lines, Sally was wondering, was there any consideration given to the effect of fetal alcohol syndrome in teeth or bones? Mm. It's an interesting question. And like I said, the biggest issue is that osteological or dental markers of stressors can be present and identified. However, identifying specific etiology or origins can be far more complex. Um, here again, we are facing a number of different challenges, which brings me back to our point that I'm able and my colleagues are able to provide these indications of these are biological markers that suggest something is happening. It's then how we work with these individuals to try and determine what kinds of circumstances are occurring at that time. Definitely, I would suggest that aspects of, of substance um, consumption and things like that were very much common in the winters then as they might be now. Um, and there are markers of fetal alcohol syndrome that can be expressed skeletally. However, the individuals that are present currently, um, they are too fragmentary for me to be able to provide a definitive statement on such a thing? You know, I, I'll tell you from our perspective, you know, we, you know, we're involved with the recovery and the archeology span end of it. And I remember thinking uh, when we were doing this that we had such fragmented remains. I, you know, I just shook my head and said, geez, Gary and his colleagues are gonna have a hard time with this, but it's amazing the amount of information they could derive. And it's really, the science has become so, uh, so uh, absolutely overwhelming. and. Uh, what Gary and his colleagues have been able to do from just fragments in some cases. It's amazing. At one point, Gary, you had a, um, a graph up and Stefan was wondering why PDB and not VPDB. That's a great question. And, and I'm going only to, you would understand that. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to tell the person who asked that question, they can I'll give the email of the isotope expert I work with so that uh, you can ask him that directly. Um, I'm sure it might either it's an error on my part from importing the graph um, or a typo, but we, we will rectify it for you, I promise. Patricia was wondering, she had mentioned smallpox in the 1720s. I'm thinking she was wondering, um, did, they, did smallpox have as great an impact as like scarlet fever and dysentery? Uh, scar uh, smallpox was very troublesome, as you know. Uh, there were many epidemics running through towns in the 18th century, and actually, really into the 19th uh, and early 20th. It's amazing that we have uh, uh, smallpox uh, cemeteries if, if dating uh, to the 1880s. So it was always a, 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 an influence 
Um, and of course, it led to some of the earliest inoculations in the 1790s that uh, started to put it in recession. Uh, in fact, if George Washington had not inoculated his army, there's a good chance we would never have come through the Revolutionary War successfully because the smallpox was so devastating. I'll give it to Gary to go back to in terms of being able to determine smallpox uh, in a skeleton. It's very yeah. difficult. It is. Unfortunately, it's very difficult. There are very, very few diseases that leave clear osteological markers. Off the top of my head, one of the simplest ones that I can name would be something like syphilis, a sexually transmitted disease that upon chronic infection can leave very, very clear osteological or dental markers present. The, again, reiterating the importance of genetic analyses, I can't say enough about the fact that I feel like I am a primitive scientist compared to what my colleagues are capable of. Researchers are now more and more able to identify um, microbial or bacterial infections using genetic analyses yeah. um, extracted from bone, previously very much hard to detect. Viruses and things like that are, they don't really last, but bacterial infections can often leave um, traces or can be um, amplified through genetic extraction and analysis. So I reiterate my point that I feel that many aspects of our work remain, in my opinion, half done. The genetic component of this work and the number of different things that can be explored through genetic analyses today are far more effective than they were before. But again, everything comes down to, is there preservation um, available? And the environment we're in right now and in previous studies in this state and in other parts of the world that I've worked in, amplification was remarkable and quick. Um, our efforts here remain elusive. But again, we're going to try one more time to see if we can get these, uh, get the some information from these individuals. Yeah, you know the problem with the public when it comes to DNA and genetics, uh, they watch uh, CSI and it works every time uh, on television. But it, it's it, it, when you're dealing with archaeological bone, it, it's a, it's a very difficult process, and sometimes you get it, sometimes you don't. And but uh, I'm sure we'll just keep trying and see what happens in the future. Amy has asked, why were the tombstones moved, but not the bodies? Well, there, there, there are a number of reasons. Um, first of all, the, the people had a concept back then from the biblical ashes to ashes. And so in some cases, they thought, well, these burials have been here for so long, there's nothing left. Uh, ashes to ashes, they're now part of the soil and just take up the... Uh, um, the tombstones. But as Gary was pointing out, with all of the diseases that were going on from smallpox and yellow fever and scarlet fever, etc., uh, you know, uh, there was also probably a concern not to come in contact, not to go down there uh, and risk it uh, uh, and, and removal. So it was a combination of, you know, the belief that there's nothing left. And of course, now we know that when the soil conditions aren't correct, uh, there, there's a good chance of a bone surviving, uh, but, but probably they also didn't want to. This is, uh, contact the, the remains. This is not the only city urban cemetery we've seen in Connecticut where bodies have been moved, where cemeteries were supposedly have been moved, you know, uh, uh, and subsequently human remains were found in those original places, New London, Danbury, Hartford, um, New Haven. Uh, so whenever I read or see that a cemetery has been moved, I've come to realize that in most, most cases, they only move tombstones, never went down to the bodies. Erica would like to know, what are the primary notable important differences between a forensic anthropologist and a biological anthropologist in regards to education and practice? That's a very good question. So it is. <laughs> the simplest way I can give it is that every forensic anthropologist is in some respects a biological anthropologist. That's right. so we're broadly trained in aspects of evolutionary biology, skeletal biology, etc. Forensic anthropology, to be very explicit, is when you do this kind of work in a medical legal context. In other words, it's 
the efforts of a person like myself who is able to examine and identify skeletal remains or human remains and then provide a detailed description, but it's explicitly for the purpose of a criminal investigation. So in some respects, what we do is that it's a it's treated as a black box affair where remains are provided. No information is ever given because it can bias my investigation and analysis if someone tells me we think this is from such and such a case or this is what we think happened to somebody. We always, when you're dealing in a forensic case situation, you're very much kind of like, here are the biological signatures that are present or absent. They're either concordant with the narratives available to law enforcement or to the lawyers, or they're discordant. And so that is essentially what the factors are being a forensic anthropologist. There are many programs that train them and, uh, and are applied. It's a wonderful field to be in. Um, it's a difficult field, but to be clear, it's very much kind of explicitly for that one context in general. That's right. And these, these most of these, if not all of these cases do start off as a, a criminal investigation. It's not until the bone determined uh, that the, the remains are in fact old and historic uh, that it comes off that that kind of forensic list. But, um, you know, when remains are first discovered, that is the first question. Is this modern and part of a, a criminal investigation or is it more of a historic context? And that's when uh, the state archaeologist will come in to uh, conduct the investigation. Randy would like to know what non-organic artifacts have you found besides the time capsule? Basically, in, in terms of this excavation, the, uh, the time capsule was the key in terms of uh, the number of artifacts. But basically, the, the only artifacts we found uh, had to do with coffins, the hardware, the brass tacks, the nails. Uh, we did, very interestingly, um, find at the bottom of that cement barrel a clay uh, marble. A child now before the glass marbles we played with as a kids, I guess kids today don't play with marbles anymore. But but they, we did when I was a kid, and uh, before that there were clay marbles. They were just little ceramic rounded marbles that were fired up, and and that's what was used. So it, we found those in the context with one of the uh, uh, children's uh, uh, remains. So it could be that that was put in as kind of a funerary object for that individual, but because the context is so broken up, it's hard to, hard to really tell. But basically the artifacts were, were very minimal. There wasn't a lot uh, other than hardware and the time capsules. Ruth is asking, did you know the very rough ages of the seven individuals? Who was the oldest or what was the oldest? Uh, so the age ranges go from, I think, about three to four to an adult individual somewhere in the mid-20s in terms of age. Um, these data come from aspects of the fusion of long bones, uh, the degree of dental eruption. Remember, I talked about deciduous or baby teeth and the presence of um, permanent teeth in development in some of the individuals. And then some of the other elements, for example, an individual is represented only by a small section of the scapula or the shoulder blade. However, the available data for that shoulder blade, both in terms of its dimensions, as well as its patterns of fusion, suggests it is from an adult. However, for something like that, we only have this one section of a bone, aging becomes far more complex. So the more elements that are present for an individual, the more we can refine ages to a very kind of specific range. Another method, again, bringing up the complexities or the technical skills of my colleagues, we can also use aspects of histological and examination of bone structure has also been used as an aging technique with a little bit more clarity and, and tightness in terms of aging an individual between 20 and 30, 30 and 40, et cetera. So there are a couple of different methods that are applicable for doing the aging of an individual. We have some questions from Facebook. Will you be getting DNA samples? It has been a effort to do so, but at this point we've tried multiple times without success. We are making one more effort to see if we're able to extract and amplify DNA from any of these individuals. At this point, we have not been able to. And can gender be determined from the remains? 
That's a great question that has two components to it. One thing to remember for somebody like myself is that we talk about biological sex, being a male or a female. Gender is a social identity, which is relatively important to consider depending on what part of the world you're talking about and what gender concepts exist for those societies. Here, we're able to do identifications of biological sex through a series of skeletal measurements or skeletal characteristics. Hopefully genetic analyses will also provide XX or XY presence or absence. One of the most remarkable attempts, and I say it's remarkable only because I'm not sure if I'm right, canine dimensions for humans, your canine teeth, as a function of our evolutionary history, primate, males have larger canine teeth than primate females. Chimpanzees, capuchin monkeys, many different species of primates, not lengthwise, but actual breadthwise, as in they're relatively larger. Humans retain that character, but as you can tell, we don't have fangs or anything like that. But canine dimensions do differ between males and females. For the children's remains that have been recovered, Sex is not identifiable because a life history theory perspective is children are growing. So there is no differentiation of sex until puberty. When you go through puberty, that's when skeletally, as well as soft tissue wise, you differentiate between being a male or a female. I made attempts to measure canine dimensions in some of the children and compare them to known data on canine breadth from human males and human females. And for one of the children, I posit, based on available data, the canine dimensions for that child are more consistent with being male than female. That is only one line of evidence in a broader need for more kinds of lines of evidence, but that's an example of how it is that we're able to look at or try to assess aspects of sex from a skeleton based on whatever criteria are preserved or whatever has been documented and recorded by uh, prior researchers. If the last attempt at gathering DNA does, does work, what could be done with it? Can it be used to connect to potential uh, dis descendants? Well, that's going to depend on how many markers are, are available that could be compared to these family tree databases. We have been successful to doing that in other um, um, skeletal remains uh, uncovered in the state. Uh, but, you know, I'll let Gary take it from here. But the fact is that sometimes there's just not enough markers to be able to do those kind of matches. Yeah, I think ultimately, the answers that will be available through genetic analyses will be entirely dependent on what DNA is available and what DNA is amplified. Yep. Again, the past three years have had, in my opinion, light speed advances in the quality and the ability to identify very specific aspects of genetic markers of of health, disease, identity, many, many, many different factors, including things like ancestry and things like that, that I am utterly incapable of identifying using skeletal remains. Um, so ultimately, and I agree 100% with all of you that have this, you all have the same questions that I do. Uh, genetic analyses can inform us in many aspects of population identity, um, physical health conditions, um, genetic factors that might be indicating things about health and disease. There are a lot of things that are more known now through DNA analyses than were known before. Tying them to living descendants becomes a far more complex effort. Um, and it's not directly what I'm trying to, or we're trying to accomplish at this point. It's really just trying to understand what we can identify for these individuals from their existing context. Questions about who they may be related to today are potentially available, but that's that's a little bit of a far cry from where I am at literally just trying to get initial analyses completed um, and efforts to try and extract it. Amy would like to know, what's the cutoff for modern versus historic remains? 
Well, uh, basically what we use uh, is the National Register of Historic Places criteria. So it has to be 50 years old or more. Uh, but the police will take a look at it in terms of any criminal investigations they have in terms of cold cases and so forth. But usually we do a cutoff of, of 50 years or more. So uh, that's pretty scary because uh, at my age, I'm eligible for the National Register uh, <laughs> for quite a long time now. Uh, and it looks like we have an, one more question. Bob is asking, where will these remains be reinterred if they haven't been already? No, they, well, they haven't been already because the, as Gary mentioned, the research is still ongoing. Um, and I'll let Gary talk about this too, but basically we will uh, engage the city of New Haven and the proprietors of the New Haven Green to make that decision as to where it's most appropriate to rebury. It would be nice to be reburied on the New Haven Green, but we wanna be sure that there's the proper security involved uh, if we do so, but uh, they will be reburied, will be reinterred, but we'll, that discussion will go on with the proprietors and the, and the city. Gary? I have nothing to add to that. In essence, we have been given the permission for these analyses and these studies. Uh, upon the completion of these studies, then we then consult with the appropriate authorities um, and they make the ultimate decisions on the disposition of the remains upon completion of our work. Uh, we have a Susan and an Amy who are asking virtually the same question. Have there been efforts to find more remains from the green or are there any future plans for excavation on the green? Well, I, I hope there's no plans for excavation. We don't want to disturb them as much as we can have to, but you know, this was an accidental discovery. However, working with the city, uh, we, uh, we have put in place and hopefully still is there that um, any developments, any below ground work uh, on the green will have uh, an archeological and cultural resource uh, assessment to be sure, uh, we don't want to, uh, we would rather avoid remains and uh, maybe through some archeological survey work and so forth ahead of any kind of construction project, we could be alerted to where there are remains and do the best to avoid them if possible. So there are no plans to do anymore, uh, but certainly um, we wanna stay on top of economic development to make sure that uh, any construction on the green is, is considers the fact that there may be burials uh, below ground. And Nick and Gary, if people have any further questions for you, how can they get in touch with you? Well, I could be reached uh, if, if, if you can write it down. It's a long name, but you can reach me uh, at the University of Connecticut. Uh, my email is nicholas.bellantoni at uconn.edu. Feel free to send me uh, 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 any questions you might have on the archaeological end. And my name is Gary Aronson, and the last name is A-R-O-N-S-E-N, and I'm gary.aronson at yale.edu. Um, I, I do have to ask for your patience, though. There's many different <laughs> projects. We have a lot of projects in our laboratories, so um, I may not be able to answer your questions directly. But I, both Nick and I are very much committed, and that's why we're giving this talk, um, to, you know, science doesn't serve us, uh, we serve you. And so I think it's very important that we remain engaged with the public and try to keep you as informed as possible. Um, and I think you can tell from the work that we've done here and the descriptions we've done, this work does take time. And so I appreciate the fact that 2012 was a long time ago on one end, um, but trying to get these answers um, can be far more difficult and more time consuming than people may, uh, may expect. So we do appreciate your patience and, uh, and we will be giving more updates as we move forward. Well, on behalf of everybody who tuned in tonight, I'd just like to say again, thank you so much for such an interesting presentation. It really, really was very, um, very cool, actually. A lot, of <laughs> things, a lot of things I didn't know. And personally, I really appreciated learning a lot about Colonial New Haven, uh, where I grew up, basically. Um, I'd like to thank everybody. Uh, for joining us and please join us for our next virtual presentation. It'll be on Wednesday, November 17th, beginning at six. And it's the Doll's House Decorator, 
Mrs. Levy and her Victorian house. And again, thank you, everybody. We really appreciate you stopping by tonight. Have a lovely evening. Thanks for tuning in, folks. Thank you all very much. We appreciate taking time.